Last episode we learned about the background story of Weathertop and how you could interpret the journey of Aragorn and his friends reflecting the events of old, starting a change in Middle-earth. In case you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. This episode we will focus on the differences between the scenes on Weathertop in the extended edition of the films and the book. As always, I tried to pronounce names as Tolkien described it and spoiler warning. Also shoutouts to Kimberly80 for allowing me to use her amazing artworks. As we have learned, Aragorn, Frodo, Merry, Pippin and Bill the Pony reached Weathertop from the north over an ancient fortified supply road of the Amon Sul Tower. The road was purposely built in a way that it was hard to see who travelled on it and travellers were protected. As we learned, Weathertop was attacked by Angmar over decades, so this makes sense for a supply road. Strider and the hobbits moved careful and looked for enemies. When they made a small break, we find another instance in the book of someone talking about Mordor, Pippin in this case, and Strider interrupts him immediately, asking him to not say this name aloud, just calling the names of their terrible enemies or the place where they are from causes fear, like it's a dark spell that summons evil and calamity. For the reader it creates tension and fills these names with power. It's not just some made up fantasy word but becomes powerful and frightening in the mind of the reader. I love how Tolkien uses this and brings it up elegantly several times. It makes you not forget the name, gives it presence, helps you to classify it in the world and is also world building at the same time. Hoping to find Gandalf on Weathertop or a hint, they decided to reach it at once while it's still midday. We see Aragorn and the others close to Weathertop at day 2 in the film, but when they are on top of it, it's already sunset and dark. A small difference. In the book they reached Amon Sul's slope from the north and stopped at a sheltered hollow on its west side. There they left Sam, Pippin and Bill the pony with their luggage, while Aragorn, Frodo and Merry continued to climb up to the top for half an hour. There they saw the circle of the ancient tower ruins, but nobody was there. In the film we see the hollow at the site of Amon Sul where the hobbits rest too. Interestingly we don't see Bill the Pony here, even though he was with them on their way too. Moving the horses around New Zealand was a huge challenge, so I can understand not showing him here. Another interesting detail, in this shot we see the sunset in the background, which makes sense when they are on the west side too. A small difference, the book describes this hollow as grassy, while in the film it it's more rocky, even though all seems relatively similar to the book so far, now the differences start to begin. Of course, as explained earlier, Weathertop was not a lonely hill, but part of the weather hills that we should be seeing in the background. In this shot we see that the land is not flat in the films too and there are some hills. Actually the books mention that you could see, I assume, the misty mountains, so maybe those hills are them, but then it would be the wrong direction. The Misty Mountains are east of Weathertop, not west. I also love this shot here, especially the colors and clouds. It looks like a mystical, fateful place, which as we learned last episode, Weathertop actually is and does it justice. We also see Aragorn standing at the hollow or Dell looking into the distance. Considering that he is around the west side of the hill, this shot must be showing the north side in parts. So this early shot here shows Aragorn and the hobbits approaching from the correct side too in the film, even though the weather hills north of Weathertop are missing completely. I never noticed this detail until now, but looking at the amount of work and detail the makers put into the films, I could imagine that this is not a coincidence. Incidents. Of course, the sides are maybe slightly off if you look at the angles, light and the sky, but I think they did a good job here. In case you ask why I mention this, Tolkien very often describes the cardinal directions in the books and I think it's important to get a feeling for the world. Then in the next film scene Aragorn gives the hobbits their swords. This is actually a huge topic and a huge difference. As explained in earlier episodes, the hobbits got their swords from the Barrow Downs, which are not in the film. 
And these swords from the Downs are originally swords of the lords and kings of the ancient kingdom of Cardolan, which is one of the three kingdoms Arnor later split into. And Aragorn, of course, is related with the lines of kings from Arnor. If you want the history of Cardolan in more detail, please check the last episode. We will also discuss the swords and their huge significance next episode. So these swords or daggers in the film reference the powerful weapons the hobbits got in the Barrow Downs. We can read in the book that Dune Edain rangers also camped on Weathertop some time ago. Maybe the film references this and the swords were placed there by them for emergencies or Aragorn carried them around the whole time. After this Aragorn leaves the hobbits alone and walks around. As mentioned before, in the book Aragorn goes with Merry and Frodo to the ancient ruin on top of the hill. There the three noticed that the ground of the circle and some of the plants on it were scorched. As explained in an earlier episode, Gandalf fought the nine Nazgul here with light and flame and drew four of them away, while Frodo and his friends were still in the Midgewater marshes, seeing strange lightning coming from atop of Amon Sul in the distance during night. Strider examining all these hints connects the dots and speculates what has happened here and Gandalf later explains this during the Council of Elrond too. There was also one additional hint to be found. While discussing where Gandalf could be, Strider noticed a pile of stones and one stone seemed not burnt. He picked it up and found a G-rune, followed by a dot and three more strokes on its bottom side. In the Hobbit book we can read that Gandalf marked Bilbo's door with a queer sign. In the first Hobbit film it's also the G rune which of course stands for Gandalf. It's Kirth which means runes and is for example used by the dwarves. They are also known as dwarven letters but are originally elvish runes. Actually a writing system of the Sindar elves standardized and organized by a Sindar elf named Dairon who was a minstrel and lawmaster of King Thingol of Doriath in the ancient years of the trees and the first age. Dairon's system was known as Kerthas Dairon and it was also later expanded. The system was created in a way that the letters could be easily carved into different materials. At this ancient time Thingol worked together with the dwarves of Beleriand and when they saw the letters they laughed them because they could put them on their metal and stone works and so they started to adopt this system. Elves also have Tengwar as additional writing system. We see it on the one ring but it's however hard to carve into for example stone or metal because of all the fine curved lines. However, as the dwarves used them a lot, they were often falsely called dwarf letters. I also cover Thingol in a bit more detail in my history of the elf video, in case you're interested. So the G was of course written by Gandalf and hints at him being at Weathertop. The three strokes are of course a three and Aragorn interprets that he was there 3rd of October, so three days prior. He also concludes that he must have had no time and that the enemy was probably here too and that the light they saw three days ago was most likely connected to the Scorching and Gandalf. There's another interesting little reference here. Strider mentions the so-called Forsaken Inn when Merry asks how far it's to Rivendell from here. To which Strider answered about 14 days on foot not using the road. In The Hobbit, Thorin and company camped at a forsaken building on their way to Rivendell too, which is most likely this forsaken inn mentioned by Aragorn. In the first Hobbit film we can also see it. There is not much known about it but it seems it's still forsaken 77 years after The Hobbit in The Lord of the Rings. However, in this conversation Frodo realized his homelessness and danger. While staring at the road westwards to the Shire, he noticed two black specks moving, meeting with three others, which of course clearly indicates that it must still have been daytime. The Nazgul, and only five of them because, as explained, Gandalf on Shadowfax made four of them to chase after him. Strider thinks about what to do with the situation and discusses it with the Hobbits. The following passage in the book is very interesting and uncovers many details. First of all, the black spots seem to have no real shape. So the Nazgul, as we will learn, are almost invisible to the normal eye. 
In this case only black specks in the distance can be seen when there's enough light. Sam and Pippin in the meantime explored the slopes of the hill a bit. They found a spring with fresh water and that someone placed firewood there but also footprints which they told the others. Sadly they trampled on the marks which limited the amount of information Strider could uncover from them. As mentioned his people the Dune Edine Rangers were most likely here in place of firewood. In the film maybe they are the reason Aragorn has suddenly weapons for the hobbits as mentioned. But he also found the marks of heavy boots. It's an interesting detail in the films but we see those heavy boots with spurs in for example the scene in the prancing pony. That the black riders had spurs is implied too so the films are close to the book in this detail. However Strider and the hobbits knew that the black riders were on their way. Tolkien also describes how clouds are coming from the east placing themselves in front of the sun which maybe can be seen a bit metaphorically but is also handy for the Nazgul as they are most powerful in the dark and of course we see clouds in the film too. In the next film scene after the hobbits get their weapons the ring race became probably aware of them being on Weathertop because Sam, Merry and Pippin made a fire and were eating while Frodo was asleep who puts it out fast when he wakes up. This is an interesting solution to compressing this scene which is far longer and different in the book. Here Strider blames himself for not being careful enough and staying too long on top of Weathertop with the hobbits. He assumes the Nazgul are fully aware of where they are. To this Merry asks an interesting question. Can the Black Riders see? Strider now explains a lot about the nature of the Nazgul in this chapter. He says that the horses can see and that they have all kinds of creatures as spies so they can even communicate with animals. The black riders themselves see things differently. They don't see the world of light as for example men do. This is a hint at them seeing the so called unseen. The world has a seen but also an unseen component. Sometimes called the race world. We talked about that in an earlier episode when Frodo used the one ring for the first time but also in my nature of magic video. Strider explains that he and basically all other normal beings cast shadows into the minds of the Nazgul which only the noon sun destroys. In the dark they are most dangerous and their perception is the best. They can perceive hidden things and forms that normal people are not aware of and the one ring draws them. I think the visual effect for the unseen when Frodo uses the one ring still looks great and is fitting this description very well. It also explains why they prefer darkness. The group decided to stay where they are because it would make not much difference being on Weathertop or in the woods at night when the enemy is near. Maybe Weathertop was even the better option. To prepare for the Black Riders attack they took the firewood they found and made a big campfire preparing a meal. Strider calmed the hobbits by telling them about ancient lore that he knew very well and made the hobbits wonder about his age. When they spoke about Gil-galad he mentions that Frodo knows the story as well and that it concerns them both closely which is an interesting thought. But he interrupts Frodo when he almost said Mordor again. As mentioned this happens multiple times in the book. The events of the late second age leading to the one ring being lost and Gilgalad having to fight against Sauron's forces and dealing with the rings of power is definitely something Frodo and Aragorn connects. There are many parallels here. As mentioned in a past episode it is here at the campfire where Aragorn sings the song of Beren and Luthien. The film moved it into the Midgewater Marshes section where he sings it in Sindarin while in the book he sings a translated version in common speech. Still great that they put it into the films. Overcoming their fear will be needed against these powerful foes. It is also here where Aragorn mentions that he can go hunting because the hobbits would not have enough food for two more weeks and we also see Aragorn carrying a bow and a deer he hunted in the Midgewater Marshes film scene. It's interesting to see how they moved some scenes from the books without losing its essence. 
So the campfire scene is in the book too, but differently. Here the group deliberately lit it themselves to cast light. Strider explains that Sauron can make use of fire too, but the Nazgul don't like it, fearing those who wield it. With this the campfire was not a mistake that caught the attention of their enemies, but their line of defense against ring raids at night. Thank you for watching. As you can see there is a ton of detail in this part and I struggled a bit structuring it and bringing it into a good order. I'm also working on other videos in the background so I decided to end it here. Next episode we will look further into details and differences on Weathertop and hopefully at the fight against the Nazgul. Look forward to this, there are many interesting details that are lost in the film completely. My channel also reached 20,000 subs. Thank you all again for the support, it is much appreciated. I hope you liked the video, if so feel free to press the like button, leave a comment and in case you want to subscribe consider pressing the annoying bell too. I also have a discord server and a twitch channel as small side project where we play the original Final Fantasy 7 right now, feel free to join. Next video will be most likely gaming related, still working on the games of the decade video and I think about making a short trailer analysis video for the last Final Fantasy 7 remake trailer too. There are multiple topics that are not Tolkien related, I would love to make a video about from time to time, but don't worry, I also really want to discuss the fight on Weathertop in the next episode or the episode after that. So the next Tolkien related lore videos will be definitely new episodes for the series here. I also have some other interesting topics on my list so there will be a lot more talking on my channel too. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.